you know, I don't really know how to describe this year we've just finished, uh, even though we, we lived through it. Uh, and while there's a lot that still needs to be processing about the, the year just ended, what I do know, for good or for bad, is that relentless stress and turmoil caused by sweeping change and vast uncertainty has an exponential accumulating negative impact on every one of us that will fray relationships, skew reasoning, suppress courage, exacerbate exhaustion, and cripple faith. But such a time of turbulence also makes us more anxious about some things that are in the immediate and try to find a way to rise above all this stuff that's bombarding us to say, some, can't something help us to get refocused on the values and the eternal hope of Christ and who he is in our lives rather than all this stuff going on us. With all the tension swirling, wouldn't it be wonderful if a voice could just come out from beyond us all and at least for a moment, people across this country and around the world would lay down their position taking, release the threats that grip them and refocus on God's virtues instead of our judgmental assumptions about each other. When you make a summary, really, of the list of the events of this last year, it could happen in one year, you may feel like there's kind of a collective tension that's reaching epidemic proportions during a time when there's been so much change, and what happens nationally then accelerates the personal tension and turmoil we all feel of the individual things in our lives. But look at this, what's happened. A relentless war, of um, a half a world away has lingered on for years and years in Afghanistan with no, no end in sight. North Korea mobilized to attack on the United States with live fire uh, uh, nuclear missiles. Almost overnight, long established relationships built on power differentials in business, politics, and entertainment that allowed one group to oppress another without consequences has publicly been challenged by, num by never before, and I pray that this Me Too movement continues to go, that people stand up, don't let somebody offload their shame onto you, and if they do, stand up and call them out. These creeps gotta stop. The lowest unemployment rate in years is welcome in this time of change, but the stability is overshadowed by the uncertainty of tax ch code changes and what that means and what's gonna happen and the longer term implications, especially for your job market ahead. Technology has advanced the fastest rate ever since the beginning of time, but it's threatening our security and jobs. University campuses are highly suspect because of their perceived desire to promote social change agenda rather than preparing students for wonderful careers. So last year, athletes were frustrated over racial injustice and they rattled established norms to the core with bold protests during the national anthem. Violent clashes over racial tensions sprang up in the streets of several cities. Well-respected reporters challenged the truthfulness of the White House about substantive issues and national security, and the president fought back. And the threat of a nation willing to actually use nuclear weapons against the United States and our allies was being monitored around the globe like never before. What a year. What a year we've just finished. A year of turmoil and change for sure, but you know, as that describes 19, 2017, it even better describes 1968. Although the, it mirrors what we face this past year, 1968 really set the high watermark. The high watermark for the, wor the world's most turbulent and tragic years as all those same things happened. You know, in 1968, though, we had a surprise ending on Christmas Eve that brought to the standstill all the turmoil that was going on in the world in the midst of the storm. In 1968, it was uh, the height of the space race, and NASA was pushing to, uh, to reach President Kennedy's goal of landing a man on the moon by the end of the decade. And so just before Christmas in 1968, the schedule was accelerated in Apollo 8, um, to attempt the first manned mission to orbit the moon. They'd never been behind the moon before. 
A space capsule had never been out of contact before, so the few minutes before these three astronauts emerged from the backside of the moon, the world held its breath. We didn't know if the orbit would hold, and they'd just go off into space. And then as they showed us what they would never seen before, a picture of the Earth rising over the lunar surface, we were amazed. But then the astronauts seemed to silence the chaos and confusion of that time in 1968 when they told Mission Control, we have a special message for the people of the world. And what was one of the most watched television moments ever, a quarter of the world's population was glued to the television set when Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders brought peace in the storm, peace in a time of turmoil and change, on that Christmas Eve from space, when they did this. I got a video. Let me show it to you. It's now approaching uh, lunar sunrise, and uh, for all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the Earth, and the Earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And those astronauts took turns to go on and to read the first 10 chapters of the book of Genesis. Now, as a 15 year old, I watched that happen. And I'm sure, as in my house, like in millions of houses around the world, we were filled with Christmas Eve guests, and we were all talking about all the change and turmoil in the world and how are we going to make it through all this stuff that's going on. And when that happened, and the world stopped, and we heard the words of creation read from space, there was a silence in that room of people who just a moment ago had been buzzing about all the tension in their life and that unusual silence lingered nobody knew what to say and then somebody in the kitchen began to sing silent night holy night all is calm all is bright you know during the good times most of us who believe in Christ tend to depend on our God-given strength and skills and grit and power to get through our days. But when either individually or collectively the pressures become overwhelming, it's time to turn back to the face of God and put life back in perspective if we hope to find peace in the midst of our national storms and our individual storms. So as we start a new year, I thought it'd be a good time to remind us how to put this in perspective, not just on national events, but more importantly, where you are in your personal circumstances. So that often when we come to this point of tension, we are overwhelmed by it and we can find in the scripture a true path for going forward. Whether it's 1968 or it's 2018 or it's 2058 when you'll be at my age and I'll be in heaven, there will always be turmoil in our circumstances. So how can we live with confidence above our circumstances so that no matter what comes to us, whether it's a year like we just had or we had in 1968 or we'll have in the future, or whether life bombards us personally, how can we live above that to find God's very best? If you feel like sometimes it's too much, I want to help you to become familiar with Psalm chapter 18. Now, that's a long section of scripture, but every time you read it, I promise you, you will find something New, Psalm 18. These are the words of King David, who had more going for him than about anybody else in life and in the Bible, but then we see how he crashed and burned and the circumstance of life absolutely overwhelmed him as he turned his life into a mess filled with chaos and confusion and absolutely gripped and crippled by his circumstances of turmoil. But when he got a new perspective on God, and he could trust God rather than somehow trying to fix what was around him. He didn't just make it through on his own. He put it in perspective, and he talks about that 
in Psalm 18. Let me just pull out a few verses of Psalm 18. There's so much. It's so rich. I hope you'll study it. The Lord is my rock, my fortress and my savior. He's my shield, the strength of my salvation and my stronghold. He heard me from my, his sanctuary. My cry reached his ears. Then the earth quaked and trembled. The foundations of the mountains shook. He delivered me. He led me to a place of safety. He rescued me because he delights in me. You see, if we think we can pretty much make it through the turmoil of culture and life's personal challenges on our own, then God just kind of becomes irrelevant. It doesn't really matter. It's just something to check the boxes with. But it's only when we realize that it is the Lord who can take over and give us peace in the storm that we unleash the power of God in our life and live like he intended us to be. Because there are always going to be circumstances. We serve a God who not only created the world, but one whose breath, Psalm 18 tells us, uh, then at my command, O Lord, at the blast of your breath, the bottom of the sea could be seen. And with that power, what did he do? The scripture says he reached down from heaven and rescued me. He drew me out of deep waters. And if this is the case, that God has the power to rescue you and me from deep waters, why do we allow the pressures and challenges of the world to overwhelm us rather than live in total dependency of God? Well, I believe there are two reasons. I think, first of all, too many Christians have never come to grips with the power of God. They just really don't get it. They don't really realize who God is, who created this world and this universe and far beyond anything you'll ever see. It's kind of like the disciple Thomas. He walked with Jesus. He learned from him. He saw the miracles over and over again, and he still didn't realize that Jesus had the power over death. Thomas wanted to follow, but with his skepticism, he never allowed himself to fully trust God, and he missed a lot of the best that God intended. I think the second reason we tend to not understand the power of God is because for those Christians who do understand the power of God, we forget who God is when we get under pressure. We do pretty good when the pressure's not on, but when the pressure's there, we just forget who God is. It's like the disciple Peter. He'd been with Jesus every step of the way, walking on the water, feeding the 5,000, even to the Mount of Transfiguration where, where, where Jesus met with Moses and Elijah and heard the voice of God directly. But for Peter... When a little girl accused him of being follower of Christ, he denied Christ three times in his fear because he thought her attack was stronger than the creator God. If not living in the full awareness of God's power was true for, for them, how much more challenging it can be for us. And we have to constantly remind ourselves that God is equipped to handle every challenge that comes to our life. When life is overwhelming, we need to break free of the, of the me-centered uh, theology that we often live in and instead put our focal dependence on God. That's what unleashes the power of God in our lives. Start the new school year, I want to encourage you to take three concepts out of the scripture. The first is... Um, First is, God is more powerful than our minds could ever comprehend, but we don't live like he is. Now, Elijah was one of those believers who knew the power of God, but he didn't live like it at times. This was a guy who took on the secular establishment of the day. I mean, he took on the first team. There were nearly a thousand priests and prophets of Baal who didn't like Elijah, saying that his God was more powerful than theirs. And so they had a contest. And as you can imagine, such a contest would draw a big, huge crowd, and they all went up to a place called Mount Carmel to see this spectacle. And the Baal worshipers built an altar with their sacrifice on it, and all day they called on their God to accept their sacrifice, and nothing happened. Finally, at nightfall, the Bible tells us it was Elijah's turn. So he built his altar. And then he had them pour 12 jugs of, of water on it. These probably would have been big, uh, four or five feet tall. 
and, and then the wood was soaked and the ground was soaked and the, wa the water even pooled around it. And then Elijah prayed. And the fire of God not only burnt up the offering and the wood, it even took the water that it collected all around it. But in the next chapter, okay, that's where he was. He saw the power of God. In the next chapter of Elijah's life, we find him hiding under a juniper bush in the desert. Now, a juniper bush is about this big, and it's full of thorns. And if you want to get into that, you've got to be really in trouble, because you wouldn't go under otherwise. He was under there praying that he might die. Why? Because the queen didn't like her righteous leaders being embarrassed, and she sure didn't like that Elijah killed them all, and so she came after him. And so this guy who just the day before called down fire out of heaven was scared to death a few days later because he didn't think God had the power to rescue him from an attack from the queen. God's response to Elijah's fear is recorded in one of the most remarkable and dramatic moments of the entire Bible when the Lord says this, go out, says to Elijah, go out and stand before me on the mountain. The Lord told him and Elijah stood there. The Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, listen to this, after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle wind and the voice of God. Now, here's the point. Elijah was living in fear and turmoil because he was waiting for God to change the circumstances rather than being focused on God, who finally just had to whisper at him to get his attention. We serve a God of infinite power, but too often we live as if the limits of those power define our boundaries. Limits of our circumstances define our boundaries, excuse me. Those things that we keep us awake at night are not roadblocks that keep God from moving in our lives. They're just the starting points to unleash his power and let him really work in our lives. The Lord's more powerful than our minds can ever comprehend, and we need to live like he is and rest in his voice rather than being consumed by our circumstances. Second part of this I'd bring to you to consider today is we, will, we need to understand we will always be attacked at the point of our greatest weakness. We'll always be attacked at the point of our greatest weakness. But we're convinced it'll never happen. Moses was a remarkable servant of God. He led two million people out of generations of slavery in Egypt. He just walked out. I mean, literally just walked out. Now, there are all the plagues and lots of things happened. But he walked out, and he walked to a new land that God had promised them, the promised land. Moses was a remarkable leader in so many ways, but he had one weakness. He was so fearful that he wasn't good enough to be the leader that God called him to be. He wanted to make sure he took some of the credit for what God was doing. And at that point of his overwhelming insecurity, he was crippled. Because of his fear of weakness that God uh, had caused him, uh, the fear of his insecurity, he didn't give God credit when God told him to bring water out of the rock. And instead of speaking to the rock as God instructed, he hit the rock to show it was Moses making it possible. God wanted the people to know it was the Lord who made it possible. So after 40 years of leadership, God allowed Moses to take them to the edge of that promised land and to look over into it, but Moses was not allowed to go because God wanted to be sure the people understood they were there because of God, not because of the leader God had chosen. We all have one great point of weakness. And while we work to shore up various aspects of our life, that weakest point tends to go unaddressed because of the complexity of dealing with that one issue is not easily unraveled. So we tend to sweep it aside, assuring ourselves it won't become a problem. I got this. I can handle this. But the weakest aspect of our life will become a problem 
And if you want to know which one it is, it's the one you work hardest to keep hidden. That's where it is. And because it's so troublesome to us, it's difficult for us to work on it. And so we just go on thinking we'll never be attacked there. Now, we can all admit certain weak points, financial fears, social unaccept, social acceptable kinds of weaknesses. But if, when it comes to that aspect of our life where we're most vulnerable, really only you and God know about it. And if you're like most people, you're trying to keep it hidden from God too. But that's really impossible. Psalm 44 says he knows the secrets of every heart. There's nothing God doesn't know. To find peace with God, even at our weakest point, is kind of a two-step process. First, accept the inevitable that our weakest point is where you will be attacked if we don't allow God to protect us in that area. And we're going to get hurt. It's not a matter of just if. It's when you're going to get attacked there. I can give you scores and scores of examples of strong Christian leaders who thought they were not vulnerable, so they allowed God to deal with every aspect of their life except that one place where they were weakest because they were convinced they had it under control. But of course, just as the scripture promised, that was where they were attacked and crushed. And even though we work hard to convince ourselves it's not going to become a problem, our weakest point is exactly at the point where threats will get foothold to take over us unless we get them into God's hands. So you've got to first get it into God's hands, and then secondly, trust that God has the power to be stronger than your greatest weakness. God's more powerful than your greatest vulnerability. It doesn't mean he'll remove it necessarily. He might, he might not. But when you invite Christ to deal with that one thing that's most painful, he brings his healing power and his guiding wisdom. He brings peace. You no longer have to look for a place to hide because you belong to Christ. Maybe your weakest point is coping with the chaos and confusion of life, but you know, we serve a God of order and of clarity. Maybe your weakest point is selfish relationships that are all built around you, but we serve a God of grace and forgiveness. Maybe your weakest point is uh, a history where you've had to deal with abuse, or maybe there's anger that traps you into a persona of physically having to act tough or emotionally trying to keep people away. But we serve a God of transformation. Maybe your weakest point is trying to escape pain through behaviors you know are not healthy, or physically or emotionally to you, but you can't help it Let God fill that void with something else. Maybe your weakest point is a lack of focus and discipline, but we serve a God who created you with unique gifts and skills for a specific purpose, and he'll allow you to use them the best. Whatever your weakest point is, you can take these two absolutes from this scripture. First, you will be attacked at that point. It will happen. And second, God is more powerful than your greatest weakness if you'll put your vulnerability into his hands. Well, thirdly, we need to understand God promises to lead us to a place of safety, but it won't be because we earned it. It won't be because we earned it. We might want to believe that since, well, we serve the Lord, we try to do great things most of the time, we try to be people who honor his name and lift up Jesus, how could God not keep me safe? I'm doing all this good stuff for him. But if we deserve, get what we deserve by the standard of what we actually do, we all fall way short, dramatically short. No, God leads us to a place of safety, the scripture says, because he delights in us. Psalm 18 says, not because we have earned it. Look at the Lord's invitation. This is right from the words of Jesus. Come to me, all you who are tired from the heavy load, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and put it on you, and learn from me, because I am a gentle, humble in spirit, and you will find rest. For the yoke I will give you is easy, and the load I will put on you is light. The yoke is what they would put on cattle to guide them, to lead them into doing productive things. Jesus puts on the yoke of grace not the burden of dragging around the circumstances of life behind you. 
He leads us to a place of safety when we honor him and when we disappoint him. When we work hard for him, when we act like he doesn't exist, when we do smart things, when we do dumb things, when our intentions are right, our intentions are wrong, God rescues us from the in, inevitability of the attack of our point of greatness and uh, of weakness and leads us to a place of safety, not because we deserve it or have earned it, but only because he delights in us as his children. And so he offers us limitless grace. And we talked a lot about grace in chapel, uh, for those of you who've been here a while. It's usually the primary topic that I talk about when I, when I speak in chapel, because I'm convinced uh, that in our effort to measure up as Christians, too many have totally lost the foundation of, uh, of Christianity, that there's nothing more you can do to make uh, uh, God love you more and nothing you can do to make God love you less. We keep trying to work our way past that. But this is where the bottom line of God's grace is. Your relationship with Jesus is first about grace before it can be about anything else. Our spiritual growth uh, uh, is marked by a growing realization of how much grace we need long before it's ever marked by our level of obedience. Far too many Christians have it backwards. They believe they earn grace by their obedience. It's the other way around. I like to think of it in terms of this tweet I saw this fall from a friend. Based on the non-Christians I talk to and their impressions of what Christianity is, I don't think we've done a very good job of communicating that Christianity is first and foremost about the forgiveness of sins. If we stop judging each other, and have the kind of grace for others that God has for us. What a different place it would be. Look at the example, though, of this limitless grace of Christ. Do you ever feel like, maybe you don't, maybe, have you ever felt like you sinned so badly that God could never use you? Or some of you may feel like, you know, you'll, you'll never grow in my faith because of what's happened in the past. Well, just weeks before Jesus was denied by Peter when he denied him you know, to that little girl I told you about. Of course, Jesus knew he would do it. Jesus went to the mountain to see God face to face. In the Bible, it's called the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus became fully God so that he could talk to God. Now, when Jesus is fully God, he's not the Jesus we tend to visualize. This is what Jesus was. Jesus appeared, was transformed, so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. This was Jesus, fully God. But look who Jesus took with him to share in that supernatural moment. Peter, who he knew would deny him and didn't think he had the power, along with James and John. And as you read this scripture, it says... Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Moses, whose point of weakness kept him from obeying God so he wasn't allowed into the promised land. Elijah, who was so overwhelmed by his circumstances that he hid under a bush and wanted to die because he didn't think God had the power to protect him. How much more convincing do we need to understand that God's grace is limitless? And in the highest moment of Jesus' ministry on this earth, he had Peter and Moses and Elijah there, all who had failed, but all who he loved and delighted in. Let me give you one last thought in closing. The scripture says, he rescued me. He, now, to be rescued is a big deal. Rescued is not a gentle nudge. It's not a slow progression out of trouble. It's to be picked up out of a situation where the circumstances are dire and be transformed out of danger into safety in a moment's notice. And I don't care what town you're from, the, the newspaper is big or small, the lead story in any news report in any media market is always going to be the film of a rescue. It could be the rescue of a climber, a coal miner, a a car wreck passenger, a dolphin, it doesn't matter. If it's rescued, it's going to be on the, on the news. Have you ever been rescued? If you have, it was the most dramatic event of your life and maybe the moment on which everything else hinges. 
from prisoners of war to hurricane victims to heart attacks. They all look at the rescue of their life as the defining moment of their life. Why? Because there was such danger of, and risk of losing their life, if they were not pulled out of that by somebody outside themselves, they weren't going to live. Most of us have never been rescued in that way. I haven't in the way that makes evening news, but it doesn't mean that sometimes we don't feel that same need for rescue in a dramatic way from God. As the challenges of life build, and for some of you they have, and the tensions mount and the demands increase, the enormity of what we feel overcoming against us presses against us so we feel like we have limited choices and little hope of escape. And in that, Jesus says, I've come to rescue you because I delight in you. Spiritual rescue is just as dramatic and because even maybe more so because the consequences are eternal and of much higher value. The all-powerful creator God has promised to rescue you and me from the chaos, the uncertainty, the expectations, the disarray, the vulnerability swirling all around us. Life will be overwhelming. It will be overwhelming, whether it's now or it's 40 years from now. But God's ready to rescue you because he made you and delights in you. Will you join with me in our benediction and pray it, trusting that God will lead you, if you're facing a storm today, into a new place. No eye has seen, no ear has heard. No mind is conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Have a great day.